We'll see. We good to go? All right. I'm not to be trusted with a microphone or a clicker. Um, thank you. We have, a, we have a bit of a celebration. We'll draw you guys in. So we, this month, we're having our 25th anniversary at Peapod, which is pretty staggering when you realize that guess who's turning 25 next year? The internet. So it kind of speaks to, we're, we're so innovative and we were so beyond the curve, we were created even before the internet, which uh, gives you a little bit of history about who we are, um, and we'll, we'll tie back to that. But yeah, we, we are officially having our 25th anniversary uh, this month, um, but we like to think ourselves as you know, 25 years younger, um, but more importantly, uh, we're just getting started, and suddenly everyone else is catching up to the excitement and the potential of, uh, of this space. A um, little bit of personal history, uh, you just mentioned a couple things. So, you know, I have this conversation with people sometimes to say, how did you go from, from this? So Procter & Gamble worked on the Pringles brand. That was my first brand assignment. Um, and then I, then I went to, to, to this. Anybody know who this is? Jeremy, come on, you know. Come on. Is No, it's Henry Holland. He's super cool. Uh, so I was, uh, come on, Jeremy. Super cool. Um, so uh, yeah. I was um, leading the, I was brought in to lead the, the eBay fashion vertical business. That um, probably seems like a, a bit of an odd leap, but at the time, eBay was making a strategic pivot to, you know, from kind of that, what they used to do, which was, uh, you know, just this crazy rodeo uh, marketplace, just, you know, live and let live, just hands off, to um, the more retail like experience. We didn't call it retail, we called it retail like. Um, but it was, Importantly, the idea that somebody coming to eBay and shopping for a set of tires um, or shopping for a, a, a cocktail dress, even if it's the same person, they're probably going to need a different shopping experience. So really behind that was this idea of eBay seeing the growth of e-commerce but recognizing that they had to kind of leave some of that marketplace behind and really move to more of a retail-like structure. They created a vertical business, so they had electronics, uh, motors, fashion, home and garden, which were the four that they were the strongest in. And they, they really brought me in because they wanted people who understood building propositions and service around shopper insights. So that basic idea of taking that shopper insight, combining it with great data and analytics and building fantastic vertical experiences around that. You know, and it's super fun because it's fashion. Um, but that's Henry Holland, he's crazy. Um, but we did, a, uh, we did a, um, a, a joint effort with him for the London Fashion Week. And now I'm here, this is my new boss. That's, uh, you guys have probably met, met these, these two funny dudes. Um, so that's Andrew Parkinson on the left, uh, and that's his brother Thomas on the right. Um, and they started Peapod 25 years ago. Um, they are, uh, yeah, who, who's met these guys? They're kind of, I mean, they're institutions, right? Everybody knows these guys. Um, so the themes here, I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about uh, Andrew and Thomas. Um, they're, they're, they're great guys, but really, the theme here is started my career in CPG, fell in love with the, the potential of digital and online at eBay. Now I'm at Peapod, um, and, and I absolutely love it. Uh, but you know what? I started first 10 years of my career with Procter & Gamble. Like, I feel your pain. You know, this stuff is hard. This stuff is really, really hard. And, and now I'm on the other side, on that retail side. Um, and one of the themes that you're here is, you know, there's a better way. There's a better way than how suppliers and manufacturers and retailers have been working really for the past 50 years, and that's that's one of the themes that I want to talk about. Um, but you know, it's funny when I when I when I moved um, to Chicago, a lot of people were saying, "God, you know, you're European fashion, and now you're working grocery in the Midwest. How's that How's that going for you?" And uh, I said, "Look, you know, don't feel bad for me. This is fantastic. One of the reasons why. I mean, first of all, fashion is so 2008." It's already had its inflection point. Jerry, where are you? Where'd you go? Where's Jerry? There, there he is. Right? Fashion already had its inflection point back in 2008. It's no fun anymore. You know, there's no margin in it and it's all commoditized. Um, this is the new wild rest, like online grocery. If you want to be on the cutting edge of e-commerce and retail and what's happening in terms of the analog digital mashup, online grocery. Um, and that's why, that's why I joined Peapod. Um, all right, oops. All right, so there he is, there's Andrew again, not, not wearing the pea costume. Yeah, so that was 1989. He has a nicer car now, it's not, doesn't drive that anymore. Um, but you know, who doesn't like a good story? As with all great brand and company stories, you know, that the, our Peapod got started in a garage. 
um, in Evanston, Illinois. It started with a car. Um, started with this this guy named uh, Andrew. His hair is much grayer now. Um, but this was this was the operational model in 1989. It involved a, a DOS floppy disk and a dial-up modem. It's pretty awesome. Um, fast forward 25 years. This is this is not even our biggest distribution facility. This is uh, the one that we have in Chicago, but you can, that's just a, a, a tiny little glance of uh, what the operations now looks like. So I think that that uh, kind of speaks to where we've come in the last 25 years and more importantly where we're going. Um, so and I think the other thing too, part of the reason why I joined Peapod is on the one hand, you have this company that's been around for 25 years. It's based in the Midwest. Andrew and Thomas, the nicest guys in the world you could ever meet. You would never know that they were you know, e-commerce rock stars. Um, very humble, very, very humble about the business. Um, and yet this business has grown 10, 15, 20, 25 percent year after year after year after year. Um, and the other thing that they've done is maintain that sense of innovation and they've maintained, it's not a startup, when, and we don't talk about being a startup at Peapod, we talk about having an entrepreneurial organization. And what we mean by that is we're not afraid to, to fail, um, in fact we embrace it, but we want to fail fast and we want to fail smart. And the other thing that we talk about at, at Peapod in terms of being that, that entrepreneurial organization is that a good idea can come from anywhere. And again, that's part of the reason why I joined. You know, they, they still have a lot of fun with the brand and they're doing hugely innovative stuff. Um, I think Jerry, you had this. This is this was our virtual store. It was it was the first one in America. I think the first one was in South Korea. Then Tesco copied it, and then we copied it. Um, but really, really cool. So this was to launch our, our mobile app. We were the f first online grocer. We were the first one to launch a mobile app. We were the first one to launch a, an iPad app. Um, and we're continuing to innovate. We we took this concept with the virtual store, put it on the the side of trucks, and, and drove them around all the major metro markets. So we're constantly innovating. We're constantly having fun. Not just from a marketing standpoint, but from a brand proposition standpoint as well. Um, you know, we, we, we were looking at, uh, for the 25th anniversary, we, we said, you know, let's just collect some, you know, fun facts and figures, um, because it actually, it's not just about Peapod, it speaks to online grocery and how it's developed and how big it's gotten. It's still only 2%, you know, of a really huge um, total. But, you know, we were, we were looking at this, you know, we've got this fabulous customer. In fact, I need to call this person and say thank you. Um, They've placed over a thousand orders um, with us, and we've got actually quite a few of those um, who have placed over a thousand orders from us. Um, you know, we've talked about these numbers a little bit. The amount of money spent on online grocery shopping in the U.S. has gone from about half a million to, I think that number is probably low, seven billion, um, and it's only growing. So you guys, you're all converts. I'm not going to talk about how how big the opportunity is and how exciting it is, but um, you know, we feel pretty proud of ourselves when we when we look at what we've done. Um, it's a lot of bananas. This one is super exciting. I guess the one that the, the two that get me kind of excited because I'm I guess I'm a bit of a geek that way. Um, we were also the first one to establish click and collect in the U.S. Um, it, this is standard operating business in Europe for any of you who have, have lived in, or worked in Europe or are based there. Click and collect. In fact, I was asking a colleague the other day. I, I've lived outside of America for for 15 years and I just relocated back. I actually I had to ask a colleague saying, "Does click and collect translate?" to Americans, like do they know what that is when you say click and collect and the guy said not really, not really. I thought well god we gotta, we gotta inject that. So we've now got 200, um, we're on track to have probably 500 in the next couple years. Um, we're doing it in partnership with uh, our parent company All Hold USA, so the stop and shop and giant chains. Um, click and collect is, is absolutely uh, critical we think in terms of that, that full multi-channel, omni-channel customer experience. We know that there are some customers that don't want home delivery. This actually works for them. So when we think about our service portfolio and when we think about what is that true multi-channel experience, we think click and collect is super critical and we're investing in it. I think the other one that, that, um, that I get quite excited about because, uh, you know, and Jeremy knows this, I'm a bit of a mobile commerce freak. Um, that number is already out of date. We're up to 45% of orders. Um, I think when we look at the number of the percentage of orders that are actually touched by mobile, we're at over 70%. Um, so it's it's a huge part of our business, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's quite a bit coming on that front. Um, when I was asked to speak, I, I you know I hesitated a little bit because I said, God, you know I've only been at the, I think at the time I'd only been at Peapod two months, and I thought, as much as I'm very happy to get up and just talk shit to people for an hour. Um, I, you know, I feel like I need to make good use of people's time. And, but as I got to thinking about it, I thought, you know, 
Even being here two months, some really, really interesting observations, not just about online grocery, some ab about online grocery, some about e-commerce in, in the US versus Europe. Um, and so there, I've got kind of one big macro observation um, around what the e-commerce landscape and specifically grocery looks like in America and I, you know, again, where I think it's going. But then some, uh, some very interesting observations um, around Peapod, specifically around who their customer is. Um, and then Peapod as a retailer, again, I talked a little bit about, you know, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way, this whole reinvention of the, the relationships between suppliers and manufacturers and, and retailers where kind of stuck in a rut, you know, pay your, pay your listing feed and leave us alone. Like that's, those days are over. Unfortunately, they're still alive and well, but I think in e-commerce, e we've got to leave those days behind. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is what I'm going to call the, the, the myth of everything. So going to be a little mysterious there. Um, so the, the first observation, you know, Americans, for all of our, for all of our innovation and, you know, the, the Silicon Valley phenomenon and, and the, the, the startups, I was really struck, moving back to America after 15 years of being away, that we're not necessarily on the cutting edge of e-commerce. Um, now, mind you, I won't admit this to my European colleagues, um, but yeah, hmm. yes, I know, I'm in this room, you know, Chatham House rules, right? Um, we saw this at eBay, and it was really interesting. My, my U.S. colleagues were always very envious of not only my mobile, my mobile numbers, but just in general, kind of the, the rate of e-commerce growth and kind of that rate of adoption. And you can argue it's about, you know, it's about density. It's about the fact that, that, that gasoline costs $12 a gallon, that parking is difficult. You can argue that. You can talk about network speeds and everything else. But for whatever reason, um, they, they are slightly different landscapes. And I think arguably online grocery is probably two to three years behind the UK. Um, it might be even four years behind France. France, surprisingly, has probably one of the most robust online grocery markets in, in, in the world. Um, but again, that's good news. I was actually at a, uh, a, a another conference about a month ago, and we were all talking about the, the inflection point, and we were drinking the Kool-Aid, and talking about how great it's going to be because online grocery is going to take off. And somebody raised the, their hand and said, you know, actually, they were talking about the inflection point back in 1996, you know, and it never happened. What, why do you think it's different this time? And I said, you know, fair enough. But what's different this time is you have mobile phones. Um, the technology is changing. There are so many more entrants to the marketplace, um, and the customer demand is simply there. So, you know, fair enough to challenge that, but I truly believe that we're at this inflection point. And I think looking at yet another data point, looking at the, the, the path that Europe has gone through, particularly with online grocery, um, I think that that's a great data point to say that it's, that is where we're going and we're going to be there. And, and I firmly believe that within five years, online grocery will be minimum 5% of that giant $600 billion U.S. grocery category. Um, we are part of a bigger organization, Ahold, so the, the Dutch retailer. Um, and as much as that can sometimes create some, some interesting, cultural, um, interesting cultural discussions, um, it's fantastic because it's kept us and it's forced us to keep kind of one foot in Europe. Um, and in fact, I was in Amsterdam. Um, I was in Amsterdam all of last week, um, spending time with the Albert Hein team and the Bull.com folks, um, just sharing ideas, learnings, best in class. Um, and I came home with at least two dozen ideas that I want to implement on the Peapod business. So that's fantastic. Um, and I think the takeaway is, I think probably every single person in this room has is part of a bigger organization that has an international footprint. Talk to your colleagues if you're not doing that already, because I know that's absolutely something that we're doing at Peapod is making sure that we're tapping into that expertise and that knowledge that's outside of the uh, outside of America. Um, so that's my call out to the global organization. Um, all right, let's pivot to um, what I really love to talk about, which is which is the customer. Um, so on day two, day two of my job, after I found the bathrooms on day one, um, my first question was, who is our customer? Who is Peapod's customer? Do we know who, I'm assuming it's, it's, it's a her, who is she? Um, and it was really interesting because people would talk about Peapod uh, having a very diverse customer base. On the one hand, you have individuals who are elderly or they may have mobile um, impairments, and so an online grocery service is, is literally a lifesaver for them. But on the other hand, you have this huge group of customers who are 
young, vibrant, incredibly tech savvy, very comfortable in a digital world, busy, high income, you know, all those different things. And, and they said, well, you know, those are all of our customers. And one of the things that we're really proactively doing is saying, that, that's great, or I say we, I'm kind of driving this, um, but who is that core customer? Who are those prime prospects that are really going to be driving the future growth of this business? And, and this is kind of what we, we came up with. Um, and, you know, of course you have to have an acronym, because I did work at P&G for 10 years. So, um, no surprise, they've, they've got a very busy lifestyle, they're not overly price sensitive, um, they don't enjoy grocery shopping. This is important. People do it, they don't like it, but they do it because they're in the habit or they don't have any alternatives. Um, and to a certain degree, they, they also are planners. Um, and so, you know, we've called them our, our bugs, our busy, unsatisfied grocery shoppers. Um, these are the folks that, that we want, um, that we have a lot of them today, um, but we only have about a 3% penetration of what we think is the total population of these individuals in the marketplace. So again, we feel like we have a huge glide path for growth. And then when we start to really look at, once we were able to establish that, we really looked at, all right, so who are these individuals? Who are these folks? Um, and no surprise, they're, they're hugely valuable. Um, they're also highly influ influential in terms of their brand choices and their, their, their kind of the, the, the retailer horizon that they choose to shop in. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is very intuitive. They're very tech savvy. Um, they skew towards uh, working women, slightly older, um, college educated, very high household income. They're these involved homeowners. They tend to sp spend a lot of their disposable income on, on their homes. Um, I kind of joke that these, you know, these are the, my, fa my eBay fashion users 10 years later. Um, they're no longer spending money on their, their clothes, they're spending it on their house. Um, but some of the things that I thought were really interesting, um, there are some pieces around, you know, they're, they're hugely intellectually curious. They're not brand disloyal, they're, you know, they're not jumping around all the time, but they're very open to new ideas. Um, this one surprised us a little bit. They're, we're calling them, they're food neutral. Um, and what we mean by that, this is not necessarily the Whole Foods customer. This is not the customer who needs to know where the eggs came from within a five mile radius and which farm and what kind of feed and was it organic. They're food neutral, they're food involved. They love to go out and have a lovely meal and they'll appreciate a glass of wine, but they're not, but they're not precious about it. They're not precious about it. And I think that that's a really important distinction. Um, they are also very intrinsically driven. What do we mean by that? They don't need celebrity endorsement. They're very driven by um, kind of internal motivation. Um, they're very under-indexed on needing their neighbor's approval. Um, they're the whole what's hot and what's not, they don't care because they know what's important to them and, and what motivates them. Um, they are hugely, hugely social animals. Um, social media is a killer in this one. Um, you will live and die on social media based on, on these customers. Um, so this is, you know, as we've started to dive into this, this is helping us as, we, as, we've, as we're doing a lot of work around crafting um, our, our brand promise. We are, um, and I think it's, it's out in the public space that we have, you know, we've built a massive uh, facility in, in northern New Jersey to help us really accelerate growth in Manhattan. Manhattan is going to be an interesting landscape because you've got uh, Amazon, um, Amazon Fresh, we know is going to announce any day that they're going in. It'll be their first uh, market outside of the West Coast. Good luck with the snow. Um, the, uh, and then you have Fresh Direct, which is a fantastic um, player who's also very well entrenched in Manhattan. I think Manhattan's going to be fascinating to see and to test the theory of this all boats will rise. You know, the more players that come into this marketplace, that is going to accelerate the inflection point. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, so, you know, so the Peapod customer, it's fantastic because at, at, at eBay we had a very distinct customer, but they weren't that valuable. They didn't spend a lot of money kind of in the, 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 the UK language. They were kind of the CD consumer. It was interesting, they were heavily involved with eBay, but from a, you know, thinking about them in terms of the, that value to another retailer or to another brand partner, it was very hard to go to meetings and, and talk to, you know, John Lewis and House of Fraser and talk about the eBay customer, which quite frankly wasn't that value, wasn't that appealing. This is a very different customer. Um, the other thing that I'm so struck by um, at Peapod, I have never ever worked on a brand or a business that elicited so much passion and so much emotion from their customers. 
Um, most of the time we get it right, and, and we get these types of comments on Facebook. I mean, these were just ones that I pulled the other day. Um, here, I'll read them out because this is probably kind of blurry. Um, this is one of my favorites. Still getting groceries after Hurricane Sandy, even when we couldn't get mail. Uh, the, um, I think that the question on Facebook was, what's your favorite Peapod memory? There are so many. Which one to choose? I think my all-time favorite came after my mom placed her very first order. She put everything in and selected a delivery date. Then she told me it had better be around forever because she was addicted faster than drugs. <laughs> go, mom, go. Um, I love this one. I love this one. I'm just, I'm glad they're wearing pants. Um, this, is, this is by far my favorite. All the kids waiting for the Peapod driver, and they got so excited when they see the truck pull up. Um, and then this one, uh, I will always be grateful to the driver who arrived just as we realized the freezer had stopped working days before with so much loss and mess. He lent us insulated cases and ice packs and was so calm in the middle of my panic, I was able to save most of the food, clean up the mess, order a new freezer, and got through it because of his kindness. I mean, <sighs> right? I mean, this is, you know, you work, in a, you work as a brand owner. This is what you could spend an entire career trying to achieve. And we have that. We have that emotional connection. We have that emotional bond with our customer. But it also means that there is so much at stake, and we have to get it right. And that's one of the things that we spend a huge amount of time on. Um, you know, we're very skewed towards putting a lot of our time and resource into the operations. Because when we get it wrong, the stakes are very high. Um, so let me pivot. Talked about the customer. Let me pivot to this other side of the, of the story, which is, you know, Peapod has a very unique um, has a very unique customer and has a very unique relationship with the customer, which is fantastic, and it's really rich from a marketing standpoint. But I feel like my this other observation is that Peapod is also really reinventing and rewriting the script on the retailer supplier, and I don't even like to say supplier on the retailer partner or the retailer manufacturer relationship. Um, and I, I came across this. This was actually kind of exciting. This made me happy. Um, so this was an RNG survey, uh, and they were ranking, you guys can read, uh, following retails in order of importance to your channel, and then rank the following retailers in order of sophist sophistication. And these, it's really tiny, so I'll call these out. So usual suspects, Amazon, Walmart, Target, <gasps> Peapod, yay! Um, Safeway, Drugstore, Cadizzi, Best Buy, Staples, Office Max. That's pretty cool, considering we're only in 40% of the US. Uh, that's pretty cool. And that told me, it's like, gosh, there's something going on here in terms of the way Peapod is working with retailers, uh, not retailers, working with other suppliers and manufacturers. Um, and that part of the business has now been, been folded under me. It didn't always rest within, my, within the, the marketing team. Now it does. And I think that makes sense because it's all part of what the customer experience um, is. But I thought, you know, that's pretty cool, um, learning more about that. So. You know, as I, as I tried to dive into, right, what is this, you know, we call it Peapod Interactive. So this is the side of the, the, the business that is all about working with uh, suppliers and manufacturers. And, you know, pretty straightforward. We provide manufacturer partners with products, programs, and analytics to help develop and test, optimize long-term e-commerce strategy. But more importantly, because this is all, what we all have to do at the end of the day, is really drive those, that short-term online sales. Um, that's kind of boring. Um, let's talk about what we actually do. Um, so what, what do we do today? Um, you know, we do all sorts of cool stuff. We do, you know, we do uh, partner emails. We do uh, samples, which, by the way, our customers go crazy. So the way samples work, and they are, they're targetable. Um, we, can, we can put samples based on a type of, of individual. Um, it creates, we know it creates trial and repeat. But I actually, on my third day at Peapod, after I found the bathrooms and then found out who the customer was, my third day at Peapod, um, I spent 10 hours delivering groceries, which was super cool. Um, and that day, we happened to have a sample. Um, it was a mix pack, so there were, there were two or three different samples. I thought the woman was going to lose her mind. It was like the Hollywood like Oscar party, the swag bag. She completely lost her mind with the sample bag in the tote. So I thought, ah, remember that one. That one's, that one's uh, definitely something that uh, maybe we need to do more of. Um, we do, obviously, lots of social media, um, and then the data and analytics. Um, and I'll come back to that one, because that one is something that I feel like we could be doing a heck of a lot more in. Um, so that's all well and good. We've got a great program, and you know, for you know, having a formal program, probably less than three years. Um, we're doing some good stuff, and, and uh, we have some amazing partners. Um, but more importantly, what are we going to do in the future? So as we've talked about, all right, looking at 2015, what are those things that we could be doing? Um, 
I'll touch on this one a little bit further on, but it, we're not do, really doing joint category management. Again, that's a basic block and tackle when you think about the, the, the retailer and the manufacturer relationship. We're not really doing the extent of joint truly joint category management that I think we could be doing, particularly for online world. I think up to now, we've, we've, we've sort of been taking our cues from the, from the Ahold USA folks who have that more traditional relationship with, uh, with, their, with their suppliers and manufacturers. Um, but we recognize that online world is different, and we know that, and so more and more we are going to be taking um, our own merchandising. We have our own merchandising strategy based on our core target. Um, and so yes, there will be overlap because we all source from, from the same supplier, but we know that we've got to get much better about category management, and one of the ways that we can do that is by tapping into the expertise that, that sits you know, within this room and through those partners. This is one that I'm probably the most excited about is uh, a recommendation engine. Um, you know, in some ways I feel like, you know, you can argue that recommendations, yes, also t so 2008, this is not Brave New World, that the best e-commerce e players are already doing it. And we do have recommendations today, but we could be doing so much more. And when I think about the, the, the data and the, the purchase history, I mean, for our core customers, they're not buying one thing every month they're buying 400 items a month. I mean, so the type of data that we have on these folks and, and really being able to look at what those purchase habits are, point in time as well as over one, five, 10, 15 year time horizon is absolutely fascinating and we need to really build up that recommendation engine. So there was a plan for that. And then the, the, the enhanced search tools. So you'll, you'll hear, this is an awful word, but it actually works really well. Um, Searchandising, right? Has you guys heard that one? So this idea of in an online world, it's all about search, right? So it's not just about how do you get to that, the top of that search page. Again, that's kind of old school. It's how do you make sure that your products are being, are being service, surfaced um, for sometimes really unintuitive stuff. I mean, they could be, you know, you might have a shopper who's looking, I mean, we had, uh, we were talking to somebody the other day who was launching um, huge new product category around um, tooth sensitivity. And they got so excited when they realized that we could actually merchandise their product when people were searching for ice cream. You know, cool. Um, so we're not gonna merchandise you in the dental category, that would be silly. We're gonna merchandise you when, you know, at these other places. That's the type of thing that I want to really drive much harder. Um, customer life stage modeling. I'm gonna come back to this one because this one also gets me very excited. Um, new product launch tools. It's really interesting, as I've had a couple conversations with some of our existing partners, um, really there are two themes and the themes are very different. Some of our partners, um, the, the mission critical objective is about supporting new product launches. Um, and it really depends on, on the, the, the company. Other folks I'm talking to have said, look, we know the ROI is not a new product launch because quite frankly, to have for a new product to be a success, it's gotta be a $500 million idea. And there just aren't that many, there aren't that many of those out there. And actually, you know, you look at the new product success rate and it's like one, you know, 0.01% success rate. That's, that's not great. So really interesting that as we talk to our partners, some are very, very keen and the, the new product um, piece and the new product products, if you will, are incredibly important for them. But then we talk to other partners and they say, you know what, it's not about new product. I need you to help me maximize the ROI on my core business. So I think, again, it's a really good example of, we're not gonna take those decisions. We're gonna talk to our partners and we know that some are very, very vested in new product launches. That's part of their corporate strategy and that's where all the marketing money is going. But not everybody is like that. We want to make sure that we have products and programs for, uh, for both business cases. Um, and then the meal solutions and meal planning. This one, as we talk to, as we talk to those folks who, um, who are not using online groceries. So, you know, I've had a, you know, hours and hours and hours already of people, that, you know, those bugs. So they're, they're not shopping online today. They, they would love to. They love the idea. Um, but they're just, they're, they're barriers. And actually, they're not always intellectual barriers. Um, sometimes you'll say, well, I, I, I perceive it to be a little bit more expensive, and you can kind of talk them down from, from the ledge, but it's amazing how much, how much emotion is involved in, in that kind of barrier to getting folks to make the leap into online grocery shopping. But one of the things that really moves the needle for them is when people talk about 
you know, what is it about grocery shopping today? And they don't talk about grocery shopping. They talk about all that stuff that happens before the grocery shop. They talk about, well, I sit down on a Sunday night and I have three glasses of wine because it's the worst time of the week and I dread it, but I have to, I have to meal plan. So I have to sit down and I've got my iPad out and I've got my recipes and I'm, and then, and then, and it's, and that part's kind of fun, you know, it's, it's very inspirational and, and I go and, and it's great, but then, you know, this wonderful digital experience and then I go get a, you know, post it, I go analog, I write down the list and then I do the, sh and, you know, we talk to them, we say, what if we could just like explode that whole process? What if we took the list out of it? What, what if you could just have your recipe and all the ingredients would automatically drop into your shopping cart? Would that be, you know, would that be of interest? They completely lose their minds um, in, in a good way. And so, again, I know that this is something that, that we, need to, we need to work on. You know, Tesco's already doing it. Waitrose is already doing it. I mean, this is not, um, this is not technology that is <laughs> beyond our grasp. We actually have a couple API partners in beta testing right now that are doing exactly that. But this is where the customer engagement really starts to happen. It's, if, if you're only getting them at the, at the grocery shopping phase, we've kind of, we haven't lost the game, but we've missed a huge opportunity. So we know that we need to kind of go a couple stages before then and really capture them in terms of the, the, the meal planning and the, and the, uh, the meal solution piece. Um, all right. All right. I'm gonna, so we've talked about, you know, we've talked a little bit about that as we've reached this inflection point, there's a lot of opportunity cross-fertilization between, between uh, the Europeans and the Americans. So forget about the Ryder Cup. That's all in the past. Um, observation number two, um, we have a very unique, valuable customer um, who is very, very emotionally involved with our brand. Um, and we've got to be very careful because, you know, disappoint her at our peril. Um, observation number three, that um, I, I love that Peapod has already established uh, itself as kind of that, the retail 2.0 partner doing some really cool innovative stuff, but we need to drive that um, and kind of s supercharge that because I think we've only begun to scratch the surface of, of possibilities. Um, but really, my, I guess my fourth observation coming in after, after four months is, um, you know, I'm going to call it the, the, the myth of everything. Um, and this is, this is near and dear to my heart, having come from eBay. Um, you know, c customers will tell you they want you to carry every item at the lowest possible cost and they want the endless shelf. And this is what they'll say, you know, I just want all these choices and I want it cheap and I want it now and I want it on promotion. Um, but we all know the reality. We all know the reality. So the, this is the dream. This is the fantasy. Um, but we also know that, you know, this is the reality, right? This is the reality that we face. So, and, and, and you know, there's this interesting paradox that I'm so struck by about e-commerce that, yeah, on the one hand, it is the ultimate endless aisle, right? And there's that theme. Um, but we also all know that if it's not on the first page, it might as well not be there at all. That's reality. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, I mean, this is, this, is, <laughs> this is one of my favorites. This is one of the biggest challenges I faced at eBay. Um, so, this is as of two days ago. If you were to keyword search for black dress, you know, people say, oh, but who, who does black dress? For sure they put in a size or brand or, you know, Donna Karen black cocktail dress size 12. No, this is one of our top 10 search terms. Any given day, any given month at eBay, this is one of our top 10 search terms. When you would put an eBay keyword search for black dress, you would, this is in the UK only. Oh, no, this is, no, this was US, sorry. 1.5 million items. What an awesome shopping experience, right? Can you imagine going into a boutique, right? Oh, what are you looking for? Oh, a dress. Oh. Right, you know, I mean, oh my God. And the funny thing is, the first one's not even black. I mean, that's what really kills me. Um, yeah, I mean, just super cool, awesome shopping experience. I mean, this is just, it's, it's so wrong on so many levels. It was, re it was bad for our brand customer. You know, we had, we were, are part of our retail-like strategy. We were proactively partnering with the likes of Karen Millen and House of Frazier and John Lewis, who had fantastic inventory that was really gonna help change hearts and minds in terms of what the fashion, eBay fashion was all about. But yet, because of the way our, our best, um, best match search, search algorithms, it was very, very much about historical conversion price. 
price, right? So top of the page results rewards people who are willing to compete on price. That's not good. That's not good for the customer, and that's not good for the retailer, and that's not good for the manufacturer. Um, so again, there's got to be a better way. Um, all right, this is a bit of an eye chart. I don't want to steal Danny's thunder. He's going to talk about this in a minute. Um, so, you know, what is, what is the antidote to this whole myth of everything? Because actually, it is a myth. Nobody wants everything. And, and by the way, you can't support everything. Um, so, yep, we've got this paradox in the, the digital world. Um, consumer choice is, in theory, practically endless. But from a customer UI and a customer UX standpoint, it's a terrible, terrible experience, and we have got to get the assortment right. And actually, it's even more important in an online e-commerce world. You know, and I'll give you, you know, and part of that is around what I talked about, which is if you're not on the first page of search results, forget it. I mean, at eBay, 97% of our, of our transactions and conversions came from the first page. 2.5% came from the second page. None came from the, the third page on. Um, and even in a bricks and mortar world, I mean, think about it. The, the average, you know, the average grocery store in the U.S. is what, between 30 and 40,000 SKUs. You might have some hypermarkets that are, you know, 50 or 60,000. Um, we can do about 15,000 SKUs. Um, this New Jersey facility that we've installed, we think we can do about 18,000 SKUs. Um, but when you look at, you know, you take the category leaders um, across all the key categories, that takes you up to about nine or 10,000 SKUs. That's not a lot of shelf space left. Um, and you know, part of our strategy is we want to, the assortment and the selection we want to provide is, we kind of call it the, the, the best of the grocery store and more. That's shorthand for we think what our customer experience is. Um, but that means we're gonna have to take some very, very difficult decisions about assortment. Um, but again, it also means that we need to reach out to our partners and, and make those, some of those decisions jointly. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these. I think the one that I, um, I think the one that I am really intrigued by is this high idea, really the first two, because I think this is where there is still so much opportunity for, for insight um, around, we, we know what the category dynamic, I know what the category dynamics are from a brick and mortar world, because I, I lived in that world for a long time, and I can call up one of my colleagues in, in AUSA and find out exactly how the shampoo category works in a brick and mortar store. Well, you know what? It works. Com it probably works completely different in an online world and in an e-commerce world. And so, one of the things that w that we have an aspiration to do over time, you know, the, the 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 framework is the same. I mean, this is not this is not some you know category management 3.0. This is basic category management, but the inputs and the insight is going to be completely different for for e-commerce. Um, all right, all right, yay! Things to come. All right, so I've talked about some of these observations. Um, so what are we doing? You know, when I go back to the office, what's my day job? Um, no surprise, we're, you know, we're very focused on mobile. Um, I, I, we have a really interesting dynamic. I was so struck, not just by the mobile numbers, um, but again, grocery. On average, on average, um, people interact, change, kind of edit their order six times between the time that they first come to our site and put an item in the cart to the time that they check out. They come back on average six times. Sometimes you see a dozen times. I mean, I know my, my girls will go on and they'll you know, take out all the broccoli and put in chocolate. And so, because they all have, you know, I, I made the mistake of giving them our password. Um, so mobile is absolutely critical. I mean, it's critical. Any e-commerce person who's not doing mobile is stupid, but that's another speech. Um, but for us, it's, it's, it's a killer if we don't have it. So we are um, in about, it's in alpha testing right now with an employee panel. Um, so it's ready for prime time, but we just want to make sure that it's absolutely right, spot on. Um, but this is, you know, coming to an iPad near you. Um, you know, it's beautiful. In terms of the design brief, what were we trying to achieve? Um, you know, you guys can see it. We, with every time Apple releases a new iOS, it, it changes the, the design aesthetic. So we're just trying to make sure that we're staying contemporary in terms of design aesthetic. But much more importantly, one of the things, one of the, one of the three design principles that we had for the new mobile and tablet experience was enabling um, better content and better partner me messaging. And you guys probably know this in talking to some of the other folks. I mean, eBay, who has been a mobile innovator for, um, you know, since the first, I since the first iPhone and the, the first app, 
they just two months ago started selling ad space on their mobile experience because they were struggling with how to do it because the you know obviously content is at a super premium on mobile. Um, but one of the things that we built into this and one of the things that led this whole redesign was making sure that we had much better content space and much more opportunity for doing that kind of search and dizing that, we, that I talked about. So, you know, we've got more modern navigation, we've got the enhanced search filtering, we've got all of those features that you would expect. Um, but we've also done quite a bit in terms of making sure that we've set it up so that there are great partner opportunities to be present on our mobile experience above and beyond, you know, the, the search results pages. So that was our home, the browse again, um, and then obviously the, the uh, Android and iOS applications. So it's prettier, you know, it's prettier, but it's actually much smarter and much faster, um, and we're pretty excited about it. Let's see, what else is coming? Peapot takes Manhattan, um, we hope. Um, we certainly hope. It's, uh, we talked about this, you know, this is gonna be, this is gonna be an interesting um, next year. It will be the first market in the United States that has more than one online grocery player. You know, it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be interesting. Um, and you know, I've, I've been on the phone with a couple of journalists already because you know, they all want, you know, they basically I think they are all expecting us to all like, get in a cage and start fighting one another, and, um, which is what they're hoping. And I said, look, you know, and, and this is not just me saying the nice thing that my PR folks want me to say, but there will be many winners. There will be many winners. Um, we are really paranoid, um, and so we are watching our back um, because in e-commerce in general, you, you, you take a breath and you know, your lunch gets eaten. Um, so yeah, of course we're, we're focused on them, of course we're looking at them, and of, you know, of course I'm, I'm horrified the amount of money that, that uh, Fresh Direct is throwing at new trial offers um, this month. But, um, but you know what, it's a, we think we have a different proposition. We think that we're gonna appeal to a slightly different customer. Um, and we, we know that there, there are, there's room for many players in this marketplace, and if anything, it's just gonna accelerate that inflection point that much faster. Um, we talked to, I alluded to this. Um, this, might, this might be, this is kind of, this is kind of my baby. Um, don't, tell my, don't tell my girls I said that. One of the things that I'm, that I'm, again, that I'm really struck by, having come from a, a CPG world, and now on the retail side in e-commerce, I'm so struck by the potential to do this well. So this whole idea of life cycle, life stage management. People have talked about it for a long time, not new to the world concept, but um, you know, we, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago and with a, a leading multinational um, business who shall not be named. Um, but basically every new mother in America goes home with one of their products. Every new mother in America. The problem for them is the relationship ends. So the mother goes home with her lovely products, very emotional time, it's brilliant, they've been doing these programs for 30, 40, 50 years. It's fantastic, but the conversation stops the minute the mother leaves the hospital and goes home. Well, guess what? It doesn't stop when they're partnered with us and we can actually have that relationship over time. So we actually have a, a brainstorming session next week in Chicago where we're actually gonna talk about this very thing of how do we create a lifetime customer value that starts with the point of entry of a new mother coming home with that first baby and your product sample. Because you own that, you know, you have that relationship and you have that point of entry, but it stops. In partnership, we can carry that on. And so when you think about all those different, I mean, obviously that's, that's the big one. That's the, you know, the new moms, but there is newlyweds, there is movers, birthdays, new baby, empty nester, senior. There are, you can cut that life, cycle, that life stage in 18 different ways. We're gonna build the model based on new moms and babies, but then we're gonna take that model to you know, every other category we can possibly take it to. That's where I get, start to get really excited. Um, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, desktop 2.0, you saw the new mobile experience. We made a conscious decision with finite developer resources um, to relaunch the mobile experience because it's that important to our business. Um, but uh, over the next couple months, we are furiously um, going to redesign our website. Look, it, it's not pretty. This, this makes me crazy. Um, you would think I'd be used to it after working for eBay, but um, we have got to fix this. Um, this will be fixed, you know, on, I swear, um, this will be fixed in, in the next six months. It works today, you know, people use it, it works, it doesn't break, it's fine, but 
again, every six months, the landscape changes, um, and that's not good enough. Especially when you think about the type of customer that's coming to Peapod. She is shopping on J. Crew. She is shopping on Net-A-Porter. She is shopping on websites that are beautiful and are doing amazing things in terms of curation and merchandising. We need to recognize that, that our brand set is not just the Fresh Directs and the Amazon Freshes of the world or the, the ShopRite.com. Our brand set is, are some of these other retailers outside of our own category. Um, so again, this is our opportunity to maintain all these great features that um, just need to have some additional discoverability. But a really critical thing that we're going to be looking for is how do we build a smarter desktop experience that has that underlying publishing content and has that underlying recommendation engine. That's really going to be the two critical things that we're designing for. Um, all right. And then the other one that, as I think about 2015, what's coming, um, again, I'm a bit of a geek, so I get super excited about API and open platform. Um, we think that this is a fantastic experience, opportunity to really innovate the, the, the customer experience. So again, as we, as we talk to our partners, um, Jerry, you, know, you mentioned this more and more, that brand relationship is happening in a digital world. Um, but the problem is most of our brand and most of our CPG partners, they don't have, they don't have the transactional, you know, there's no transaction. They do the research and then again, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, 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 a dead end. We've got this, this is, uh, this is actually not live with Mr. Clean, but we've, we've got a widget. We've got a widget that anyone can plug in their API um, and people are looking, they can research Mr. Clean or they can research whatever product they're looking at. They can immediately pop it into their Peapod cart. So this gives our brand partners through their own website the ability to make it fully transactional, um, which we think our partners have been giving us pretty good feedback around. This other one that I'm excited with, so Gather Table, this will actually, you guys get a little sneak peek. This is actually being announced. Um, Ooh, today, as a matter of fact. Um, so this is a, a, a startup in Seattle um, being funded by Howard Schultz um, and the founder of Jugstore.com. So they're really, really well funded. It's, it's meal planning. The idea is they want to create the Netflix of meal planning and recipes. So there's a very cool user interface. You sign up. It's a subscription model. Um, you, you sign up based on, you know, are you paleo? Are you vegan? Are you meat? Do you like fish? Do you like lamb? And then every week, you get your seven-day weekly meal plan that's custom designed for you. Um, and it's machine learning, so it gets smarter over time. Again, very inspirational. People who use it love it, but there was no transaction. There was no transaction. It was purely for planning. People still had to go do their analog list. We now have the AP, API. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm messing around with it. I've been messing around with it the last couple days. Um, but the API will go, will go live um, this weekend that they can get all their recipes and then they can automatically drop all of the ingredients into their Peapod cart. So super cool, right? Super cool. And we think that that's, again, we don't have a monopoly on all the great innovation ideas. And so we see API and open platform as a way to really get um, tapped into all of the innovation that, that is potentially out there. So I'm excited about it, but that's just me. Um, I was hoping, I was hoping, because I'm a little bit selfish, new in the, in the job, I was hoping to have just kind of a decent conversation because I want to hear what's on your thoughts, brains, concerns. It's 3 o'clock, so I think I'm right at time. Why don't we do the, what? It, I, don't want to, I don't want to hijack this. <laughs> so we have 15 minutes for break. Okay. Coffee's here. Okay. If people want to get up and grab a drink. All right. Are there burning questions? There will be time at the end because I'll have a day for Okay. Perfect. Let's let's. There's a, there's a session at the end for half an hour for time. You're such a diplomat. I love it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Cool. Listen, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate you putting up with me. I promise, if I come back next year, I'll be much more knowledgeable. So, yeah. All right.